Good afternoon. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, welcome uh, to this lunch symposium uh, that uh, clearly will be present an end-to-end -end AI solution for precision hard care. Um, I'm, I'm really excited uh, to hear uh, like the latest advances uh, in AI uh, and um, how this really impacting uh, not only clinical care but also in population health and also like learning the history on how this all came about. So the folks that are in the back, I think there are a few remaining seats up front, but please feel free to uh, come. So I'd like to now introduce uh, the speakers of this session. Uh, first, Dr. James Ming, uh, we, we, which don't need any introduction. He has been the past president of SECT, a prolific researcher, probably one uh, of the uh, scientists that publish uh, extensively in cardiac CT uh, and uh, is the founder and CEO of Clearly. Uh, so Dr. Ming will give the first talk, but also we are going to have Dr. Andrew Choi. Uh, Dr. Choi is also a, a, a contributor of SCCT and he's the co-director of cardiac imaging and associate professor of uh, uh, George uh, Washington University in, in Washington and the GW Heart and Vascular Institute. Um, and he is going to show some very interesting cases and how working uh, with AI in clinical practice. And finally, we'll have a third talk uh, from Dr. Suba Raman. Uh, Dr. Raman, uh, she is uh, the division chair of cardiovascular medicine and she is the vice president for the cardiovascular service line at Indiana University, so we are going to see a perspective in uh, population health and how AI and coronary CTA may play a role here. So with that, without further ado, uh, Dr. Min. Great, um, thank, thanks so much. So I, I will try to just spend the next 15 minutes or so um, trying to give you the rationale of what we were trying to do, I think more than anything. Um, and then I'm gonna turn it over to our distinguished speakers. But um, about five, six years ago when we decided that we wanted to do this, we, the, the rationale or the impetus to, to trying to develop this as a company was that we felt like we had understood the science, we had applied it into clinical practice, but we didn't have the tools to be able to make it available everywhere. And so when people said, well, what are you making? We said, we're gonna make a digital care pathway. And then the, the answer most, most of the time was like, what's a digital care pathway? And we said, well, I can tell you what it's not, and then I can tell you what our goals were. What, it's, what we weren't trying to do was become uh, an AI company or even a CT company per se. Like what we were trying to do was um, make a care management platform that would be comprehensive, standardized and personalized. Comprehensive in the sense that it would have everything that you would need um, to take care of somebody with coronary disease. Um, standardized because we know that standardized approaches always beat bespoke, you know, shoot from the hip approaches. And then personalized because we felt very strongly that the field of cardiology and coronary disease was really stuck in population-based approaches that didn't look at patients as N of one. So what we did was we, we started a company to try to have a really ambitious purpose to um, create a world without heart attacks. I think this is eminently possible. And I know it sounds like a lofty goal, but I think that based upon what I see in the science and then our own personal experience, I think that we have figured out that, yeah, right now we have enough tools to really prevent heart attacks from happening. Our personal experience came from here. So that uh, woman right there is Erica Jones. She's a good friend of mine that she and I started a prevention program about 11 years ago called Heart Health. And there we took a very different approach to cardiovascular disease prevention in the sense that we said, look, all of these markers that we're using, whether lipids or blood pressure, hemoglobin A1C, they're very imprecise, right? They miss the vast majority of the folks who have heart attacks. And what we wanted to do was really get to personalized assessment um, using coronary CT angiography. So we would do baseline CT, um, we'd do intermittent serial CT, 
And what we had with the luxury of was about 20 CT technologists just manually circling images and annotating them, quantifying, characterizing all of the disease that we saw. We also approached coronary disease not as just an LDL lowering phenomenon, but as really a polyfactorial process that includes the cardiometabolic disorders, the inflammatory disorders, the atherosclerotic disorders, the thrombotic disorders, and so on. And I think what you can see from that list there is that our toolbox is very, very heavy. We've got a lot of tools that 10 years ago weren't available to us, and now we can really go ahead and try to use those. The third thing that we really tried to emphasize was health literacy, both for our clinician colleagues who weren't imagers, as well as for the patients who didn't have a background um, in healthcare. And then when we said we're gonna make this program and we're gonna make it special and make it work, um, we'd love to take credit for something, but we actually just copied. We looked around at the most successful preventive care, care paradigms in medicine, and they were all in cancer mortality <laughs> prevention. And what you see over there on the left is all the stuff that I was taught when I was training as a house staff, all that have been replaced over the last 20 years by the things on the right. And if you look at the mammograms or the colonoscopies or the lung CT scans and you ask, well, what is the commonality amongst those successes is that they use some form of advanced imaging to directly visualize disease. And when I contrasted that with the way that we were doing cardiovascular disease prevention, you see that we're doing it exactly the same way that we've been doing it for the last 70, 80 years. We use risk factors, which are upstream markers of disease. We use symptoms or downstream stress testings or stenosis measurements. And all of those things have the same common um, virtue that not, none of those things are actually heart disease, right? Heart disease is atherosclerosis. And so it's like going to somebody who suspects that they might have breast cancer and nobody examines the breast. That seems sort of weird, right? So we said, well, let's stop going upstream. Let's stop looking at downstream sequela. Let's just look at the disease itself. And there we were helped by this field, right? This field of uh, the SECT and all of the members in it have contributed to our va understanding of vascular biology in such a way to understand that heart disease is not a single entity, but many different phenotypes, all which carry very different behaviors, right? So what you're seeing is an LAD. You can see all of the color-coded cross-sections are red, yellow, and blue. They represent different phenotypes of atherosclerosis. And what we've learned from such landmark studies as the PROMISE trial that Udo did, the Scott Hart trial that Dave Newby did, um, we did a trial called ICONIC. And what we found was that the darker the plaque, the higher the risk, right? So that, and once you hit that red threshold, that is the strongest discriminant of who will have a heart attack and who will not. And then ironically, there was a very clever fellow, he's no longer a fellow, but he was with us for a couple of years from Holland. And he said, well, if the dark plaques are bad, the bright plaques have to be good. And we said, no, no, we've spent years and years publishing on calcium scoring. And what he showed us that was that we were wrong. That if you see that blue plaque there that becomes very, very bright white, that's actually protective against heart attacks. And so if you say, well, okay, if the dark plaques are bad and the bright plaques are good, the next qu obvious question is, well then, how do you turn the dark plaques bright? And so we had done a study uh, with statins. It's been repeated with PCSK9 inhibitors, colchicine, rivaroxaban, icosapent ethyl, DASH diet, physical activity. All these good things that we do for people, they don't make plaque go away. What they do is they transform the plaque from that dark, dangerous phenotype into a brighter, more stable phenotype. And that was what was associated with an eight-year reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events. So if you take all of this together and say, okay, what does this mean? We now have a personalized approach to cardiovascular disease prevention, where we're not looking at surrogates of disease, we're looking at actual disease, and we can track it over time. The problem is that to make those little purple and yellow circles, like, was taking hours and hours and hours. And the other problem is that when you start to look at all of these things, nobody understands what you're looking at because they're not imagers, and people don't care about pixels, they care about the people in front of them in the office. So we had to try to start something that would really try to allow us to do exactly what we were doing at Cornell and New York Presbyterian, but in a standardized, comprehensive, personalized, and then most importantly, in an automated or a digital pathway. So we set out to create this digital care pathway. What does that look like? Currently, it's five steps, right? We use a CT scan to really identify the disease, and there we had to solve for the problem, of how do you get these intricate measurements at the submillimeter scale um, in a way that you can turn it around quickly, accurately, and so on. The second step is really, how do you take all of this advanced imaging, all of this advanced disease phenotyping, 
and translate that so that a nurse can understand it, a primary care physician, a general cardiologist without imaging background, and so on, to get all of the medical stakeholders in the care pathway on the same page. The third was what we did in the office with the patients, was we showed them their images. We know that the number one driver of compliance is the patient's perception that the condition that we're treating is serious. So once they see their disease, now they understand it, but we've got to bring them to that under level of understanding. And then the fourth was probably the hardest thing that we had to do was, how do you treat heart disease when we've never actually done that? We've treated upstream risk factors of disease, we've treated downstream sequelae of disease, but we've never treated the disease itself. And then finally, five, how do you track that disease to success? How do you demonstrate therapeutic success, or in the case of failure, to intensify your medical therapies until you do achieve success? So let me just take you quickly through these five steps. This is the first one. It's probably the most interesting to us as a society of cardiovascular CT, where what you have is a true near-automated assessment. It's a, so it's a web-based platform. It's truly quantitative at the patient vessel segment lesion level. Um, we've def demonstrated the accuracy through a series of multicenter clinical trials against core lab readers, quantitative coronary angiography, IVIS, OCT, near field infrared spectroscopy, invasive FFR, and then we really tried to use this, leverage a lot of these AI enabled algorithms to provide every feature of coronary disease, whether it's atherosclerosis, whether it's measures of vascular morphology, whether it's measures of ischemia, and so on. And then the way that this is visualized, because if you're not an imager, you don't know what you're looking at. Or if you, what we do is we curate all of that data over there on the right. But I don't know anybody in his right mind who's gonna read through all of those numbers. So what we did was we translated all of that. And the translation comes into the centerpiece page, right? So this is a web-based platform, you just log on, and I think everybody knows exactly how sick this person is, how they're gonna treat this person, because you've got measures of atherosclerosis, stenosis, ischemia, CAD RADS, and then you've got a visual display, or you've got a very short summary that you can just read if text is, is better. What we wanted to do was use this to be interactive. This is a teachable moment for that patient, so you can click on any place in that coronary tree, and you can dive in deeper. Now I'm just looking at the LAD. I'm looking at the LAD um, for atherosclerosis and all of these different types of plaque, positive arterial remodeling, low-density plaques, and I'm also looking for measures of stenosis, whether MLD, percent diameter, percent area stenosis. Once we did this, a lot of the doctors said, look, this is all I need. I don't need anything further than that. But the preventive cardiologist said, well, look, we care about atherosclerosis. Like, so we want to really go deep into the measures of atherosclerosis, whether it's percent atheroma volume, whether it's like the amount of plaques. And we want to segmentally look at the kinds of lesions and which lesions look to be, you know, more of those that have the low density and the positive remodeling. Then what the general cardiologist said, and everybody said, was like, look, we care about stenosis. I care about stenosis a lot. And so you can see that you can see very simply where the, the, the severe stenoses are, where the moderate stenoses are. On the upper right are the vascular territories by mild, moderate, severe, chronic total occlusions. And on the bottom, you can see all 18 coronary artery segments with both percent relative diameter narrowing or you can see absolute minimum luminal diameters, normal reference diameters, and you can click on any single one of those bars and interact in 360 degrees, and then you can also do submillimeter coronary mapping so you could do some pre-procedural planning. Then people said, well, just because it's stenotic doesn't mean it's necessarily ischemic, and we said that's true. And so there's an ischemia algorithm um, right now investigational, but there is an ischemia algorithm that you can, that, that is very different than has been approached before. The way that this is different is that there's a binarization of is this vessel ischemic or not, but then within each vessel you can go to each and every lesion and interrogate it to see why there is ischemia and what you might consider doing about it. Once that happened, the imagers said, well, we, we got to do the CADRADS because that's part of the report. So that is also included there, both for stable symptoms as well as acute symptoms, as well as the management recommendations associated with the CADRADS document. And then I, as a former or current, continue to do a lot of research, I wanted the data. And so everything related to the coronary artery, everything related to the atherosclerosis on a per patient, per vessel, per segment basis, I wanted to just click a button and download everything as an Excel spreadsheet and start doing research so I didn't have to manually curate everything. And then everybody said, well, we want a report. And so we auto-generate a report. It's in direct accordance with the Society of Cardiovascular CT guidelines. It's fully editable so that you can add or, or delete as you, as you want. 
And then once we generated this report and showed it to clinicians, they said, well, these reports are useless because I'd, I'm just not going to read through all of this. So what we do is also generate a one-page simplified report um, for the clinician, not for the imager, but for the clinician. We're using red, green, and yellow helps to really help the, the clinician and support them in understanding sort of the importance of the findings. And we juxtapose that with auto-annotated images related to the plaque volume, the plaque type, the remodeling, the stenosis, and so on. So we thought we were done at that point in time, but the patient said, well, we don't like this report because we don't understand it at all. And so what we do is we generate a patient level report. It's a personalized report written, written at a fifth grade reading level so that every non-medical lay person can truly understand it, heavily reliant on visualization so that people can truly understand the condition that we're treating, why we're treating it, how we're treating it, and how we're going to track it. And then the next step of the pathway was like, now that we have everybody on, on board, like how do we actually treat this disease when we've never actually treated heart disease directly? So about a year and a half, two years ago, we published a staging system. We realized that coronary heart disease is the only disease I can think of that doesn't have a staging system. Every other disease, Alzheimer's, asthma, cancer, they all have a staging system. And so what you can see are the stages zero through three, zero, one, two, three, by total plaque volume, by percent atheroma volume, that correlate, but they crosswalk both angiographically and prognostically. And then in collaboration with the American College of Cardiology Innovations and Prevention Working Group, Group, um, we created a treatment algorithm, right? So that treatment algorithm intensifies medical therapy commensurate with an individual's actual disease burden, and then again looks at coronary disease as a very polyfactorial process, atherosclerotic, thrombotic, cardiometabolic, inflammatory, and situational. And then the last step of the pathway is sort of like why you check your mile splits when you run or why you look at the Peloton leaderboard. You want to know that you're getting better. Right? Or if you're getting worse, you want to know how you can get better. And so this is actually an interventional cardiologist who had a scan in 2020, and then in 2023 went on a PCSK9 inhibitor, and then came back in 2023 for a repeat scan. What I told him is there's not one goal here, there's two. The first is that if you come in with 260 units of plaque, we're going to keep you at 260 units of plaque. We're going to stop the progression of new disease. But the second thing that's just as important is that amongst the 230 units of plaque, how do you turn those dark plaques bright? And in this person's case, you can see there was a drop in the dark plaques by about 80, and there was a rise in the bright plaques by about 80. So he's not regressing his plaque, he's transforming his plaque um, through that medical therapy. This obviously on a per patient basis, but you can do this on a per vessel or per lesion basis as well. And watch those low density lesions that have bulky plaques and positive remodeling change and transform over time. And that is what we were trying to create, was a care pathway, right? So comprehensive, standardized, and personalized, really to identify, educate, empower, treat, and track to, to prevention of, of cardiovascular disease. Sounds like a lot, it's actually quite easy. It's like if somebody gets a CT scan, it auto ingests into our cloud in about an hour and a half turnaround time. Um, all of those things that we just visualized are available to the user on any web-based interface. And so I'll just conclude here, like again, what, just to answer the question of what we were trying to make was a care pathway more than anything. We wanted it to be comprehensive and all in one. We wanted it to be clear and understandable. We wanted it to be accurate and generalizable. Um, prognostically useful, clinically actionable, quantitatively trackable, and the most important thing that we wanted to, to do is usher this field out of these population-based approaches that miss the majority of people at risk and help personalize somebody and really individualize somebody's heart disease evaluation. So I'll just end here and I'll turn it over to our speakers, but thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jim. We'll leave the questions towards the end. Uh, so Dr. Choi will follow with some interesting case presentations and insights of implementation of this AI algorithm. Well, thanks, Ricardo. And I've got the honor and pleasure to follow Jim Min in giving a talk here. What I hope to actually do is to build upon what Jim has presented uh, as a really overview and to make it very real to us as clinicians and cardiac CT imagers so that we look at this from a case-based perspective and also look at the science so that we can understand the validity and, and ask ourselves, do we trust this uh, information? Uh, these are my disclosures. So what I hope to do with you is to first recognize 
recognize the high accuracy of CAD assessment through clearly guided CT to improve outcomes. Second, apply novel insights that we gain from Clearly with validation to near-infrared spectroscopy, intravascular ultrasound, which is the gold standard set up by our field for high-risk high atherosclerotic plaque to best identify patients at risk for ACS. And third is to understand the superior prognostic value of Clearly's quantitative plaque assessment when compared to current methods. So we'll start with a case. Uh, this is a 61-year-old patient presenting with chest pain, not unlike the patients that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. And what we have laid out here is an LAD in a curved multiplanar reformat. And I'll just give you a couple of seconds to look at this and ask you know, how you would adjudicate this lesion by the arrows. All right, so I think, you know, this is a room filled with experts and, and great CT readers, and so I think you may interpret it one way. Um, many of our early uh, learners or those, tra those in training starting out will look at this and see there's a big calcified plaque that's present. There's also non-calcified plaque that's present. Well, that looks severe, especially with that calcified lesion that's present, and indeed, that was how this was read on the clinical side, over 70% stenosis with CAD-RADS4. Now, how does clearly add to this or allow for an augmented intelligence? And so we're going to go through a case uh, through a series of convolutional neural networks um, after the imaging data is sent to a cloud. The clearly software automatically picks the best high quality phase for image interpretation and does whole heart segmentation labeling, uh, atherosclerosis, and stenosis assessment. And so what you're seeing on the left is a curved NPR view uh, highlighting the calcified and non-calcified plaque that was present in the proximal LAD. We can do a fly through as we're seeing in the middle uh, to show the plaque features. And it may be hard without the contouring bar or eye to be able to see what's plaque or what's fibrosis. Um, the software gives us a straight NPR reformat in a 360 degree view. And we can better appreciate through color coding uh, I'm going to freeze it here because it can be hard sometimes to differentiate the plaque types. And so um, we, get, uh, we get a look at the type of plaque that's present. We can color code it between uh, non-calcified plaque and calcified plaque, uh, as well as the low-density plaque that shows up as red. Uh, let me just go here. All right, and as you see that fly through going through the middle. Um, we also get a clear picture, the blue calcified plaque there in the presence of positive remodeling. Uh, and so features that help us to prognosticate uh, the, our patients as, as Jim had shown us. Uh, now, we also get from this the quantitative plaque information through this centerpiece that gives a graphical layout of where the stenoses are through the graphical interface on the right. And then we get a layout of the plaque as well as the degree of stenosis in each of the coronary segments, uh, each of the epicardial coronary vessels, and the opportunity to be able to interrogate it and adjudicate and see exactly where that plaque is present, how it quantifies, what the plaque types are, and look at it for every vessel and lesion. And so to summarize what's happening with this case, our 61-year-old with chest pain, the clinical site read was severe stenosis, greater than 70% stenosis, CADRADS4. But what the clearly has taught us is that indeed what, what, what probably many of you, the expert readers in the audience, would saw, had seen is that this is a moderate grade stenosis. Uh, the clearly had graded it at 53% CADRADS3. Now, where's the ground truth for this particular case? QCA was 41% stenosis. An invasive FFR was done of 0.82, non-significant, and so the, uh, clearly agreed with the invasive measures, and there was an overcall on the clinical uh, side. As part of the reporting, uh, we're told about the plaque volume, 292 millimeters cubed of plaque, stage two that we'll hear about in the next talk, as well as a layout of every single uh, uh, segment and the degree of stenosis in this reporting. To go into this more detail, we do know, and we've learned through our experiences and through the clinical trial, that less experienced readers will overclassify obstructive CAD when you compare it to expert readers. 
This is data from the Promise trial. And if you recall from the Promise trial, when it was set up 15 years ago, many of the sites, uh, about four in 10 of the sites were read, uh, the CTs were read by less experienced level two readers. And what they learned is that uh, core lab interpretation classified uh, 41 percent fewer patients as having significant CAD when you compared it to the site. We also know that more experienced readers are more accurate than less experienced readers. So what does clearly do? Well, I think what many of, on a day-to-day -day basis, folks do when looking at stenosis is to take the reference diameter of the proximal segment of the vessel, compare it to the area of the most significant luminal stenosis, and cal use that to calculate percent diameter stenosis, or it's a gestalt or maybe uh, just a, a dartboard that you might use to do that. Uh, now, uh, the way uh, the software has been trained is to not only account for the proximal vessel, uh, but to add the distal vessel, as well as to interpolate the lesion length, because these, uh, these stenoses are not in isolation. They have uh, tapering, and they're, uh, they're quite complex. How does uh, clearly perform in clinical practice? How does it help us provide high value care where we can reduce downstream unnecessary testing and reduce costs for our patients? What we have shown is that clearly is an effect, effective gatekeeper to invasive angiography. Uh, applying data from uh, the CONSERVE study, a uh, multi-center international trial of 22 sites and 747 stable patients. Uh, clearly, or uh, in the literature, AIQCT may safely allow for an 87 to 95 percent reduction in invasive angiography for those patients with stable CAD, and there is no risk of added uh, of uh, adverse major cardiovascular events. How does clearly an AIQCT compare to stress perfusion, that which many of, in, the, in the United States, 90, 95 percent of the sites are doing on a regular basis, uh, with QCA and FFR's ground truth, where they clearly outperformed uh, stress perfusion at a 50 percent stenosis threshold, at a 70 percent stenosis threshold, um, and in comparison to invasive FFR um, with an AUC of 0.9. And we have a case example on the right where on the upper part of this we see a CT scan with uh, non-obstructive CAD, a 40 percent stenosis in the LAD, uh, and on the bottom a non-significant FFR for a patient that had a positive stress test. And so the stress test was a false positive. How does clearly compare to invasive QCA? Uh, clearly is highly accurate versus invasive QCA. This is from a multi-center study in which there was CTA, invasive angiography, FFR, and clearly avail available. High accuracy, um, uh, uh, very high AUC on a per patient basis for at a 50 percent and 70 percent stenosis threshold. Um, when we compared AIQCT to QCA, um, the accuracy was similar against invasive FFR. And we further looked at cases of discordance. Why was there a difference between the clearly analysis and the QCA analysis? And what we found is that there was about a 10 percent atheroma burden. And it begs the question, Ed Nickel, uh, the president-elect of the society and the editorial for this paper asked, you know, why are we only ha allowing ourselves to use QCA as a gold standard when we know that CTA has been the way to uniquely identify non-obstructive plaque and to quantify that non-obstructive plaque? And that accounts for those differences here. Uh, the clearly has been accurate against CTA and FFRCT, and this is a case example that's shown here, and this was a Young Investigator Award winner last year presented by Rebecca Jonas. And so what we've shown in this first part through this case example is high accuracy uh, with stenosis, high accuracy against our, our measures and reference standards of ground truth of stress perfusion, QCA, and FFR. Uh, let's uh, shift gears a little bit into a second case. Uh, this is an example of a 37-year-old patient uh, presenting with chest pain. Uh, young patient to have, even younger than me. I know I look young. Um, and so, um, you know, a, a, a group of people that I think we are missing. Let me uh, play this. And so if we open up the uh, case here, uh, I want you to uh, just pay attention to uh, the CT part of this uh, on the left as it zooms in. It may be hard to see what's happening both at a view and in zoomed in. What I hope you start to appreciate is the presence of non-calcified plaque. Now, by our current guideline, that SIS score might be just one, uh, but if we use clearly to quantify the amount of plaque that's present, 
we see that there's a high volume of non-calcified plaque. Now, can you tell if there's high-risk plaque or low-density plaque? Very hard to do uh, without really careful analysis. What they clearly are showing us is through the color coding and through uh, the red here, it's showing us that this is the plaque that's at the highest risk for plaque rupture. We get an appreciation, as we're seeing in the middle, of uh, the presence of uh, positive remodeling. So we have positive remodeling, low attenuation. We have a high non-calcified plaque burden in the proximal LAD. Our center pace uh, now shown here shows us that uh, stenosis, a CAD RADS 3, the total plaque volume of 314 millimeters cubed, almost all predominantly non actually all non calcified plaque with zero calcified plaque and, uh, in, and significant amount of low density plaque. We have the layout. Uh, we have the, all of the research tools to be able to quantify the plaque that's available for those that are of that interest. And then uh, the very nice uh, reporting that you can customize to your site and put in the features of this uh, report through the clearly as, as uh, best needed for local practice uh, according to SECT guidelines. And so to summarize this uh, uh, unfortunate patient, I think, younger than me, 37-year-old patient with chest pain. The clearly read was for moderate 53% stenosis, CADRADS3, that there was a high burden of, of plaque, a total plaque burden of 314 millimeters cubed, a percent atheroma volume of 19%. I think it grades this at a much higher uh, risk uh, scale than something like SIS alone, which would have put this at a low end, SIS of one. Um, all non-calcified plaque, a calcium score of zero, low density plaque, uh, and we've put this in as per the new uh, staging system that's been uh, proposed, and we'll hear again hear about this, based on the PAV of 19, and so stage three. Uh, unfortunately, this was a tragic case for this young person because um, uh, all this plaque was uh, predictive, or it, uh, uh, he had developed an anterior myocardial infarction a month later. And so um, while uh, we, we failed him as a medical community in preventing his heart attack, we don't have to let this happen to other individuals. Um, to quickly go through why this matters, we've learned from Dr. Curry's study and from SCAPIS that nearly half of our asymptomatic patients demonstrate plaque. One in six have a calcium score of zero. That SECT atherosclerosis guidelines teach us through a bevy of, of literature that high-risk plaque, even high-risk non-obstructive plaque is just as important as obstructive plaque in predicting ACS events these high-risk plaque features. As Jim had shown us, uh, plaque exhibits a spectrum of atherosclerotic risk. The highly calcified plaque, the 1K plaque, is predictive or maybe indicative of transformation after treatment. The low-density plaque uh, and the non-calcified plaque is what is, uh, leads to cardiac events. Um, I was part of CADRADS 2.0, and so I think it is a great guideline. We have the chair of CADRADS 2.0 here. What it has set us up for the field is incorporating plaque into our reports and set up a paradigm as a first step to include. Um, and we asked, how do we, how do we do plaque on a qualitative basis? Well, what we said as a starting point is maybe you just uh, kind of say mild, moderate, severe based on what you think is going on. Calcium scoring, a segment involvement score is a semi-quantitative approach or visual assessment. Um, I think it was a good step because it, it lets us think about it, but there are limitations and we acknowledge this. Calcium scoring is more of a, a, plaque, a risk marker. It doesn't capture the whole total plaque burden. Uh, I, uh, the visual estimate or SIS will have significant variability between readers and it adds time. Uh, I know my radiology colleagues, um, you know, kind of uh, were complaining, like, why do I have to add this? Because it adds more time to our workflow and it also, you may miss non-calcified plaque. Um, manual quantification is time-consuming. It is part of, the, uh, part of the literature, but not, not generally available for clinical use. We've uh, shown there's high variability among expert readers for plaque assessment, especially when it comes to non-calcified plaque and high-risk plaque, and the correlation coefficients, as you're seeing here, are quite modest. What clearly depicts is more high-risk plaque, 58 more percent high-risk plaques in level three readers. And if you look on the left, can you pick, can you determine yes or no if there's high-risk or low-density plaque? What clearly lets us do is um, say that yes, there is. We've learned a lot of new things, and we're learning new things about the vascular biology of high-risk plaque through clearly. And here in this study, um, clearly depicts high-risk plaques against a ground truth standard of NERS and uh, near-infrared spectroscopy and IVIS with high accuracy. 
It is redefining what the definition of a high-risk plaque is with novel plaque morphologies that are uh, predictive and more predictive of our current approaches for ACS. And just published this week in JAK Imaging, led by uh, Dr. Nurma Ahmed from uh, Amsterdam, who's part of our group this year at GW, clearly based plaque staging improves long-term prognostication, tenure prognostication when you compare it, um, if you incorporate a clinical model, but over clinical risk, calcium scoring, manual plaque, and CADRATS 2.0 that includes stenosis and, and segment involvement score. And so it helps really teach us that this is an approach that has high value to us in our clinical environment. And so to conclude, clearly guided assessment of CAD has high diagnostic accuracy to enable improved outcomes. Clearly offers us novel insights into high-risk atherosclerotic plaque that includes validation to NERS and IVIS that best identify patients at risk for ACS and clearly has demonstrated improved prognostication for cardiovascular events through quantitative plaque assessment when we compare it to current guideline-based methods. I thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, maybe one quick question. So, so basically, you demonstrate a case of high uh, accuracy for quantification of stenosis uh, above and beyond clinical reads, and then a second case regarding like plaque quantification and going to the plaque features. So, how, how are you seeing that in clinical practice? Uh, you, you have a program, different readers. Uh, is that helping with standardization, quantification? Uh, what, what is the impact that you are seeing daily? Yeah, it's a great, great question. How is this integrating? I think where this has been really helping us, and I think where it helps us as a community and as a field, is this idea of augmented in intelligence. You know, how can we use clearly to help us, especially if you're on the borderline and you're not sure which way to go, you can use this to be able to really define, have an objective, reproducible approach that you know is objective um, to grade the stenosis. When it comes to plaque uh, burden and plaque volume, we have noticed, even with CADRATS 2.0, that there's a lot of variability in, amongst our readers and the reads because I think it's, uh, it can be quite qualitative. Sometimes it can be hard to pick up, and to be able to do the really careful contouring that one has to do is, is time consuming in the course of a busy day. And so this really adds uh, to our augmented intelligence. It gives us information um, that we're not able to routinely do reliably on a day-to-day -day basis. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, so let's invite Dr. Suba Rahman for our last talk. Uh, and Suba will be able to share to share her experience with population health. I think she brings a unique perspective uh, of being the vice president for cardiovascular service line at uh, Indiana University. Uh, so, Dr. Rahman. Thank you so much. I appreciate being here with this uh, esteemed team and, and for all of you taking some time uh, to be here. I have no disclosures. So I'll talk a little bit about um, our current approaches to preventing myocardial infarction in those with diabetes. Um, consider a novel approach, and um, you'll hear some uh, kind of themes from the prior talks uh, today. Uh, go over some of the logistics of implementing a population health-based program, and then intertwined into this are the treatment considerations. So I think we all know that diabetes is terribly common um, both in the United States and around the world. Um, and diabetes can fuel atherosclerosis, uh, and it can do so through um, different components, such as uh, lipids, through inflammatory pathways, through thrombotic mechanisms. And this atherosclerotic disease can lead to a number of um, bad outcomes for patients. Myocardial infarction, as well as stroke, ischemic cardiomyopathy, heart failure, and peripheral arterial disease. And while we've made strides over the years, uh, we still have room to go, and not just for the general population, but even for the younger patients that we're seeing. You, you saw a really uh, tragic case of a young person in their 30s in Dr. Choi's presentation. And this is variable across uh, segments of the population. So 
if we think about does diabetes confer an increased risk of MI in Caucasians a little bit, uh, big time, unfortunately, uh, for me and others, and South Asians. Um, so can we do better? Uh, can we diagnose and treat the disease and not just risk factors or other surrogates for disease? So what do we do currently? Uh, let's look at uh, a smorgasbord of guidelines from the ACC, American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association, and U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. They start with what has been well vetted for some time, which are the pooled cohort equations, and based on that, then move to lifestyle changes, blood pressure management, and so on, all of which are appropriate. Um, but have we made an impact, and does it equally apply to everyone with diabetes? Uh, I would suggest the evidence says it is not a homogeneous um, risk. Uh, this is uh, data just looking at distribution of coronary calcium scoring. Uh, in those with diabetes, you can see a, a nice spread. And maximum stenosis, also quite variable amongst individuals with diabetes to the point that the ACC AHA um, statistics document says that diabetes is associated with great heterogeneity and risk of cardiovascular disease, then diagnosis should not be considered a coronary disease equivalent, and we should pursue risk stratification in those with diabetes. So as we saw in that mechanism slide, the lipids, the inflammatory pathways, the thrombotic mechanisms. As Jim mentioned, we now have treatments for all of these different pathways. And then add to that the newer anti-diabetic agents, the SGLT2 inhibitors, the GLP-1 receptor antagonists. So quite a, a large armamentarium of tools for us to help patients once we've made the diagnosis of atherosclerotic heart disease. And now, more than ever, it's a highly quantifiable disease when we combine CT angiography with AI analysis enabled with Clearly. Um, this is the staging that was mentioned previously. Uh, you can see the just intuitive difference when you look at the stage zero vessel versus the stage one, two, and three vessels. Um, and these thresholds of plaque volume and percent atheroma volume were chosen to optimally distribute patients with no disease, non-obstructive, single vessel, or multi-vessel disease. And this is data that um, Dr. Troy and others have uh, coming out that shows the staging of disease, as we've seen staging of disease across the spectrum of human health, impacts prognosis. So, can we use this approach to not only stage but treat atherosclerosis? And I was uh, honored to be part of this uh, innovation and prevention working group with the ACC. The analogy is we don't wait for patients to come in with colon cancer. We look for early lesions, we treat them according to the stage of the disease, and we prevent cancer. Let's take that same mindset to integrate the ability to measure atherosclerosis, atherosclerosis disease burden and treat it accordingly. So what do we do for somebody with no disease? This um, is one approach to consider. You might still pursue goal-directed medical therapy, but then engage in shared decision-making. Are we treating a number with high-intensity statin, or should we be treating the absence of disease? And if that strategy is what you pursue, let's make sure it's working. Let's look again in, let's say, four years. Let's say there's stage one disease. Um, let's pull out high intensity statin, perhaps add azetamibe, and then we don't wanna wait as long because now this person has measurable disease to then say what has happened with our treatment plan and what adjustments should we make? And so on with stage two and stage three disease. So can we apply this to patients? And this is where I'd like to share with you some of our work at IU in our population health pilot program. What is population health? It's defined as health outcomes of a group of individuals, including the distribution of such outcomes within the group. I moved to IU uh, about three and a half years ago, and 
one of the appeals was the ability to impact the health of the state of Indiana. So a statewide population, you can see our facilities are distributed across the state. And our population health program is defined as the population for which we take risk. And this can be our employee health plan, so our employees who get insured through our, our institution, Medicare Advantage, and then other value-based contracting with employers and other entities. And this is not a dissimilar population, uh, I would suspect, compared to what you're dealing with in your communities. The green shows areas where there is a forecast in um, an increase in patients age 65 and older population, I should say. So we know the disease not only is out there, but it's increasing. And so we decided to offer a pilot program of CTA and clearly analysis to the employee um, health plan, covered lives with diabetes to detect and measure coronary disease, striving, of course, to improve the health outcomes for these individuals, but also look at the financials. Are we preserving and hopefully growing the margin needed to serve the mission? This is a, a detailed stat, but let me talk through the workflow. So eligible IU Health Plan members receive an eligibility letter with contact um, to contact customer service to enroll. Once they're enrolled, one of our utilization management nurses will tee up an order for a coronary CTA with the AI analysis with Clearly and appropriate pre-medication. Once the scan is done and the analysis is completed, we have reports in our electronic health record. The clinical report generated by the imaging physician as well as the lay language report that you've seen that the patient can look at before they have a visit with the clinician. In that clinical visit, it's actually pretty easy to use the outline of that lay language report to talk about the disease, what we're looking for, why the risk is important, and then look at what their coronaries um, show. They, have, they all have primary care physicians who maintain regular care, and then program follow-up is coordinated by the health plans. And so far, uh, for a preventive offering, it is being taken up by about one in five el eligible individuals. And I'm told this is not dissimilar. Actually, it's a little better uptick um, compared to other preventive offerings by the health plans. And one of the things I hear from patients about that they really love is this lay language report. As you've seen, um, it has four sections, three kind of talk through general information at a very very accessible reading level for, for everyone that I've seen from people who work in facilities um, to people who are in the C-suite of the organization um, before they land on, okay, what did my coronaries look like? So they're really empowered with the knowledge they need to understand what's going on in their heart. Um, so let's personalize this, if I may. The 63-year-old woman in the program had diabetes, signed up. Um, sedentary, she works as an administrative assistant for our team. Um, and has had long-standing type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and hyperlipidemia. Um, she was really motivated by her family history. Her mom with diabetes had died suddenly, presumed sudden cardiac arrest at age 59. And so she was really pursuing aggressive um, uh, risk factor uh, treatments. So she was on high-dose statin as well as icosapent ethyl. Um, her diabetes was well-managed with metformin, uh, insulin as well as empagliflozin. And if you looked at her numbers alone, they looked pretty good. Blood pressure was in the 120s over 60s. Her A1C was 6%. LDL was on the floor. Um, triglycerides a little bit higher than normal, but overall, um, you know, her primary care and others thought we're doing a good job. She enrolled in the program and unfortunately had a lot of disease. Um, so you've seen the analysis and the take-home message was she had a very heavy burden of coronary atherosclerosis, 23% atheroma volume, stage 3 disease. And we had a conversation, you know, shared decision-making. Um, this was completely new information to her, you know, quite a shock. She thought she was doing everything possible. We went through those treatment algorithms and settled on adding azetamide, but also really pushing, you know, for more... Um, uh, lifestyle changes, and so she engaged with our nutrition coach. Um, physical activity was dialed up, 
and uh, she, she definitely made some changes in her life. Came back a little over a year later. Um, numbers look about the same. Her weight has come down, her blood pressure's down, and overall her plaque has stabilized and it's um, transformed, you know, as was shown previously, a slight uptick in the calcific component of her plaque burden, um, but overall encouraging uh, that we can't take our eye off, off, the, uh, off the goal here. Still a lot of disease, but it, it looks to be stabilized. So our return on investment analysis is ongoing. What are we looking at? We want to look at our spend on drug therapy. We expect this to go up, right? We're identifying and treating disease. But with those effective medications, we expect that our total health care spend for our covered lives with diabetes is going down. Um, and our health outcomes are the biggest um, uh, measure. What's happening with MI, stroke, peripheral vascular events, and what's happening to other measures of cardiometabolic health. So I'll offer you these take-home points. Uh, one is to say there are a lot of motivated patients out there who want access to these types of technologies that enable them to take advantage of more informed preventive approaches. Population health, I think, is a useful platform to deploy novel approaches to diagnose and treat disease, not just risk factors. And think as you go home, um, what are my interests and how do they align with the goals of my institution? Are you in a fee-for-service environment where you can direct towards perhaps greater utilization of preventive services, other clinical services? Or are you pivoting, as many of us are, to value-based care, value-based contracting? And here the promise is you truly will have a cost-effective tool in such an environment. Thank you very much. Sure. All right. Thanks so much, Suba. Like, uh, th th thanks to you and to Andrew Choi. I'm going to turn it over to Ricardo. I just wanted to make one one comment before I do. Like, so, like, what we understood this field was what developed the science, right? Like, it it, it took 15, 18 years, but we got there, and then we realized there wasn't we we couldn't translate, it, and so we translate into clinical practice, and then we realized we didn't have the tools, and so we developed the tools, but. Our company is dedicated to the science. And so, you know, Jay Earls was the one, along with Andrew Choi, who led a lot of the Clarify 1 through 6 studies, all the diagnostic performance studies. And then about six months ago, we had the pleasure of, of, um, of hiring Udo Hoffman. Doc, we call him Professor Dr. Udo Hoffman, but who led the Romicat 1 trial, the Romicat 2 trial, uh, with Pam Douglas led the Promise trial, and most recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine this week was the, he led the Reprieve trial. Um, so he has designed two very large scale um, randomized control trials that, as I see them, will not only change the field of CT, but will change the way that we practice uh, medicine. And so I, I think right now we're just going through a site selection process with these two large-scale randomized trials. And anyone who might be interested in this type of trial, what I would do is encourage you to come to our booth and just let us know and we'll contact you. Or you can just email info at clearlyhealth.com, clearly with two E's, and just give us your information information, but would love to try to grow this field together, and uh, I think Udo will be leading that effort for years to come. So I'll turn it over to Ricardo, but thank you for, for your attention. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm just wondering, as the talks uh, evolve and, and we learn more, is uh, we, we potentially have a tool that we can really utilize and, and enhance what we do with coronary CTA. Uh, and would be great to, to really attack and prevent heart attacks in the future. Um, so more to follow. The science uh, is leading us, but really exciting to see um, AI uh, helping the field of cardiac CT. Thank you very much and enjoy the conference.